Thank you, Reverend Dr. Father J. Samuel Samuel. Dear friends, as you can see, he is a Catholic priest, the Archdiocese of Madras Mailapur, who was ordained in 1983. He has served in several parishes in the city, including St. Andrew's Church, Chulai, and was the first parish priest at St. Joseph's in Royal College. He did his higher studies in Rome, as well as at the Sorbonne University in Paris, where he studied biomedical ethics. He has been residential professor of Christian ethics at the Sacred Heart Seminary in Madras. He has also been professor at the Papal Seminary in Pune. He has obtained his doctorate in Washington, D.C. He also has a diploma in mass communications from the Philippines. He has been visiting faculty for both Loyola and Stella Mars College here. He has presented papers in Italy, Bangkok, and the Philippines. He also animates retreats for bishops, clerics, and religious, both men and women. Please bring your hands together once again. Our next topic is a very interesting one. It's called India's Irreparable Loss. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bernard D. Sami. He's a st step in. He has served as Associate Professor in History and former head of the Department of History at Royal College, Madras. Currently, he's the coordinator of Royal Institute of Social Sciences Training and Research. He has been a Salzburg Fellow. And he has known to be a person who is deeply concerned about the plight and welfare of migrants and refugees. He has attended a seminar, a summer, a summer institute, in fact, at Oxford University on forced migration. In the year 2002, he attended a fellowship program at the Stockholm Institute of Education. He was an executive committee member of the Association of the British Scholars in India till September 2016. He has also attended a pilot course on statelessness in the International Institute for Humanitarian Law in Italy. He is a guest faculty at IIT Madras. Please bring your hands together for Dr. Bhavan Kisan. Today. I live in Raiva, not Chennai. For those of you who are not from Chennai, recently there was a film on North Chennai, Vada Chennai, which portrayed the North Madras in a very poor light. Um, but when I look back last 40, 50 years, I lived and grew up in Yenno. Father was working in the electricity board, so we were we had our quarters there. So Yenur had such a big, uh, you know, population of Anglo Indians. And then you go on from Yenur, you will find in Tiruvanchiyo, in Tondiyarpet, in Raipuram, where I live now. All my, my neighbors have immigrated, and uh, Cholai, Vepari, all those places. Except for Perambur, some of them have moved to Madhavaram. I think the Anglo-Indian community has been uh, reduced in size and in number. And the contribution they have made is substantial. And I'm sure that many of them would have highlighted that. In my opinion, three areas in which was, in your contribution has been substantial and exemplary. One is the area of English medium schools. Even now in India, we have the three types, CBSC, Matriculation, and Anglo-Indian. Frank Anthony, he kept two things with him. He said that, I will, you know, with the betrayal of India, he, was, he felt that he was, you know, his community was betrayed by the British. At the same time, he said that, I will get political representation for my community and I will get my Anglo-Indian community to have this educational system. Not only for us, we will also give it to others. I think because of you, the schools, English medium schools and English education has been introduced, developed and today in India, if many of us are able to speak in English, the contribution goes to you. So great contribution by Thank you. 
Before coming here, I was reading some of the comments. A lady was asking, where should I put my daughter? In CBSC or in matriculation? And there were a lot of responses. And most of the responses said that you put them in the Anglo-Indian educational system. There is an internal growth for the students in that. And it is not only education. No Anglo-Indian school claims that we are number one, number two. They don't come in the ranking. But at the same time, the students are not defeated in life. We don't hear suicides in the Anglo-Indian education system. I think, I think your educational system has given students to meet life, to face life, to, life, to live life fully human. And I think that has been a, the greatest contribution that you have made. The second one I would like to tell you is one of the fundamental duties in India. It was a later incorporation in the Indian Constitution, Article 51A and Part 4A to the 42nd Amendment to the Constitution in 1976. And in that we have added 10 rights, 10 duties, and we have increased to 13, 14 now. One of them it says that to preserve and value the composite culture. I think if there is one community that can be called as an example for composite culture, it is the Anglo-Indian community. And I think you have contributed substantially for adding color and vigor to this culture. And uh, this is one of the things which is in danger today because there is a monocultural and there is a, you all hear about communalism on religious, you know, on, on the basis of religion, on the basis of caste. And I think one community which has fought against all this, added color to the composite culture, is the Anglo-Indian community. The third one about which I wrote some time back, and in my classes on international relations, I used to tell my students that I consider Anglo-Indians as a nation. You are a nation. I think that what Frank Anthony, Gidney and others have missed in terms of getting a state for the Anglo-Indians. You have a language. What constitutes a nation? A nation, a state is head and a nation is heart. Language, culture, race, shared history, these are all the components of the nation. And I think you are a nation. And what Frank Anthony and others could not achieve, I think must be taken up by the Anglo-Indians now to ask for a state for Anglo-Indians. It is not too late and you should not give up your, your claim for the state. You should ask for a state because in India, the states are divided on linguistic lines. It is linguistic states and you have a language English and you qualify for a nation I think this fight should continue, you should not give up. And finally friends, by the large immigration that has taken place, India has become poorer. We lost you and many countries gained you. And I think even after immigration to Australia, England and many other countries, you have not given up your identity. 21st century is characterized as the century of identity. People becoming very conscious of their identity. And I think you have kept your Anglo-Indian identity very strong, both in the home country and in the host country. And you have been an example for the diasporic community, which I would call it as, which has, which has demonstrated very clearly dual loyalty. Loyalty to the home and loyalty to the host country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bernard Nisami, to his book from your heart. I must mention that in this, during the reorganization of states, the issue was hotly discussed in Parliament. And please, please come up, Dr. And when this issue of reorganization of states on the basis of, lang on the basis of language was discussed in Parliament, Frank Anthony was one of the very few, if not the only voice, arguing against it. 
Even at the time of independence, he said that this is a pan-Indian community. That was a line taken by the All-India Indian Association. I'm sure when our leader Barry comes, about, comes over to speak in the next session, he'll touch upon this. But this is something that I would uh, like to bring to your attention. It's there in, the, in Frank Anthony's book, British, Britain's Betrayal in India. I would now like to move on to our next speaker, very, very special. Mr. Gopal Krishna Gandhi is a retired IAS officer and diplomat who served as the governor of West Bengal from 2004 to 2009. He is the grandson of Mahatma Gandhi. As a former IAS officer, he served as secretary to the President of India and as High Commissioner to South Africa and Sri Lanka, among other administrative and diplomatic posts. He has served as the director of the Nehru Centre London, UK, as well as the ambassador of India to Norway and Iceland. So we felt that he is the ideal person to speak on the subject of the significance of the anglo indian community, the socio-political significance in this country. And we would love to hear Mr. Gopal Krishnan speak. And it's a, it is a great pleasure that I invite him over to the program. I'm very grateful for the opportunity to participate in this symposium, in this conclave, in this convention. My wife and I thank the hosts for including us in this very pleasant and, if I may say so, very important event. I think the importance of this gathering and the importance of the discussions that are taking place today may not be quite appreciated by us in the heat of this moment, in the chronology and sequence of events, in the anticipation of the talks that have yet to take place and in celebration of the talks that have taken place, we may not quite understand how a gathering like this is so important to India and to India at the present moment. I would like to devote the few minutes that I have, and I will not take more than a few minutes, to a contemplation of the thinking process of the Constituent Assembly which was designing the constitution for the Republic of India. We had already stepped into what can be called the, the democratic unfurling of India. A semi-popularly elected interim government was in office. Elections were going to take place in 1952 very shortly after the Constituent Assembly was going to finish its work. But more than anything else, the Constituent Assembly was thinking of what the future of India is going to be like. And we know the main provisions of the Constitution. But almost unnoticed by commentators and unflagged by political analysts, was this important, crucial provision for the nomination of Anglo-Indian members to the Parliament of India and to the State Legislative Assemblies in India. Now, the population of Anglo-Indians in India at that time may have been roughly computed but there was no exact figure because in the questionnaires of the 1941 census, like the preceding censuses, there was nothing which would have really led to a definition of the Anglo-Indian and to a self-definition of an Anglo-Indian. And so it was a question of intelligent guesswork. But the numbers of the Anglo-Indian population of India were not what determined 
his provision. The provision for the reservation of two seats in the future parliament will come. Have less to do with the numbers of the Anglicans, but much more to do, and in fact, everything to do with an important principle, which is the representativeness and the inclusiveness of the political structure of a republic. I will digress here for a moment by saying that in the Republic of South Africa, President Nelson Mandela, when he formed his first cabinet and filled the first senior offices in the new republic, he included a disproportionately large number of Indian South Africans in those positions. There were, if I remember right, something like six members of the Council of Ministers, many of cabinet rank, of Indian origin. The Speaker of the South African Parliament was an Indian origin, Frenetic Bala. The new Chief Justice of South Africa was an Indian origin. And then Nelson Mandela's colleagues in the African National Congress asked him, Madiba, as they call him, Madiba, why so many Indian South Africans in your government? So many more than are required by the proportion of the population of Indian South Africans in South Africa. And he said, the Indians in our new government, Rainbow South Africa, are not reflective of the proportion of their population, or the percentage of their population to the total, but the proportion of their contribution to the freedom struggle of South Africa. of two nominated members in the future parliament in India, let me make it absolutely plain, was not a favor done to the Anglo-Indian community. It was a recognition of the Republican spirit of the Constitution. It was an advanced proclamation of the rainbow to borrow Nelson Mandela's phrase of the rainbow nature of the Republic of India. One or two more aspects of that. No vote bank was being catered to by that provision. No government was going to get more votes for the ruling party by this provision. It was a recognition of the fact that the democracy nature of the democracy of India requires a political majority to be in the saddle. And I am saying political majority because that is the majority which a democracy is meant to have. Not a community majority, not a religious majority, not an ethnic majority, caste majority but a political majority, an intellectually arrived at politically pos political position, reflected by the number of votes which that political position, that political ideology, that political manifesto obtains. That constitutes a democracy. But what about a republic? What is the difference between a democracy and a republic? Now that is a very elementary substance of political science. But we need to sometimes remind ourselves of that. A republic is impervious to majority and minority. A republic has an equal space for every single person who is a part of that republic. The Anglo Indian community, though numerically undefined, was clearly a vulnerable section of Indian society. A republic is meant to erase vulnerability and replace that susceptibility to majoritarian overwhelming by an equalizing of opportunities 
and positions. And that is why this presentation is not a nation. And in one stroke, and that is the great contribution given by the Anglo Indian community to the polity, the Indian polity, one stroke, this meant that not only was the community's representation, a fragile and numerically fragile community's participation in parliament assured, but in the same process, almost incidentally and by default, two or three other forms of vulnerabilities were protected. The English language for one, the Christian religion for another. And in a certain body, the body of the representatives of the Anglican community, a completely castlessness of that representation was protected. Reference has been made more than once today to Frank Antony. Frank Antony's life requires a biography, and I think a critical biography must come of Frank Antony. We have in our midst today Mr. S. Mukaya, who has given a biography of the community, and I would like all of us to give a hand to Mr. Mukaya. <laughs> objective and self-critical. For instance, she makes this extraordinarily important point that in the Indo-Pakistan wars, the Anglo-Indian communities in both countries participated in that war. Now, if the Indian side had great Anglo-Indian soldiers, airmen, and Navy officers, so did Pakistan. Now, that's an objective statement. It has to be made. It has to be made absolutely upfront. And she's, it's a very objective. So an objective biography of Frank Anthony is given, in which Frank Anthony's contributions are described. But Frank Anthony's vulnerabilities are also described. Were, were Frank Anthony and A.E.T. Barrow in a good equation, or was there some conflict? And if so, what was that conflict? Because here were two giants. Frank Anthony was a tremendous MP. But was he a dominating educationist in his own society? Perhaps he was. But Frank Anthony was a remarkable human being. And a speech that he made on the 13th of September 1949 in the Constituent Assembly on the English language is a speech which should be, I do not believe in anything being compulsory, but it should be widely read and assimilated. Because he makes these points. He says English is an Indian language. I do not quite endorse the predecessor speaker's suggestion about him in a separate state. But that is a nuance. Frank Anthony made this very important point, which Dr. Disami also made, that English is an Indian language. Frank Anthony said, in the future, English has to play a huge role, and please do not push it aside, do not brush it aside. Frank Antony was from Jabalpur in Madhya Pradesh. From the same city, in the same constituent assembly, was Seth Govindas, also an MP from Jabalpur. Seth Govindas was a congressman. But his mindset was very majoritarian. He said India should be Bharat. Not India that is Bharat, but Bharat that is Bharat, or Bharat that is India, not India that is Bharat. Jabal. Frank Anthony also Jabal. Beatrix D'Souza was telling me that when she was in Parliament, she and Yogi Adityanath sat next to each other in the same house. Look at the extraordinary beauty of this. 
Yogi Adityanath and Beatrix D'Souza sitting next to each other. That is a product of the wisdom of the Constituent Assembly of India. Yogi Adityanath is today Chief Minister. He has his views. Beatrix D'Souza is not Chief Minister, but she has her views. And they were identically placed. No favor has been done to the Indians. It is the reverse that has happened. And I just want to conclude by saying, the definition in Article 361 has to be taken for review. In this day and age, for the male line to be privileged, is jarring. It is discordant. And in a community where, where men and women have complete equality, look at the composition of this hall. Very few or the stage is not very representative. <laughs> but the audience, the number of women in this hall, that I'm not even counting the Stella Marie students, the number of women in this hall is exactly how nature intends it to be. It's half and half.
for this golden opportunity which my wife and I deeply cherish. Ladies and gentlemen, we could not asked for more. I don't think anybody else can address this topic, the significance of Anglo-Indians and the Indian social political, political fabric, the way Mr. Gandhi has done. Very soft, very subtle, very poignant, and yet very incisive. Thank you very much, sir. So kindly give it to our volunteer. We have Sasha O'Brien who has a question for Mr. Gandhi. Of course, for the Anglo Indian 
community, but much more so for the people of India, because they are there as representatives of the people of India. We should not box. We should not box the MP and MLA who is nominated under what is commonly called the Anglo-Indian quota into their Anglo-Indianness. That is the address from which they have come. But the destination to which they are going is India, not their community. So let us not say, did so and so MP, did Brian, did Barry, did Beatrice do XYZ for the community? They may have, they may not have. Much more important is what have they done for India. And when that compilation comes up, when that compilation, inshallah, when that compilation comes up, let it show an MP or an MLA as not having done so well, as not having done so great, as not having put the questions that she or he should have put. But then she also showed what they did. The Anglo-Indian community is not meant in Parliament to hold a mirror to itself. It is supposed to hold a mirror to India. This is a larger issue, and Barry O'Brien's name has already been mentioned, and he's on the edge of his seat, and I'm worried he may fall off his seat because he has to speak at the next session. And so I must ask Barry O'Brien to respond to that. Mr. Gopal Krishni Gandhi was the governor of West Bengal when I was nominated. Uh, I felt much more comfortable with him being the governor. He couldn't question me. But now since he's asked me this question, I will not get into whether I have done my bit or others have done their bit. But what the young lady has brought up is the truth and the reality. Sir, you are aware that India was virtually a one-party government for years. And then maybe two, but after the late 70s, we have gone big time into coalition politics. And very unfortunately, Almost without fail, I would say eight out of ten nominations. We not only have two seats in the Lok Sabha, we also have a nominated member of this in the state legislative assemblies. Not all, but many. To answer your question simply, forget about asking them what they're doing. Since I've come from a quiz background, just have a picture quiz and ask all Anglo-Indians with a picture of the current MP, who is he? They will not be able to answer. The point I'm trying to make is, with a few exceptions, many of them sitting here, Dr. Beatrix, when you were the MP, you were standing on the balcony with me in Bo Barracks. People in Bo Barracks knew her. She went around. Charles Dyess, you may not agree with all that he says, but he's visible. Where are you, Mr. Dr. Dyess? Yeah. Uh, Oscar Nigley did a fantastic job, two terms as MLA in, in, in Tamil Nadu. <laughs> Vinisha Nero just completed one term, has got a second term. The problem is you don't get a term or a second term because of your work for the community or whatever work you do. You get it only to fulfill the political desires and ambitions of a particular political combination or party. That's the truth of the matter. Unfortunately, I wish there could have been a system evolved where Anglo-Indians elect their nominee. That's impossible now. That's it's impossible, unfortunately, because Anglo-Indians don't live in pockets anymore. Anglo-Indians don't live in ghettos anymore, or you know, the ghetto is not a good word, but you know, just in a few areas. Anglo-Indians are all over the place. As I travel around, I meet them in the Northeast. There are Anglo-Indians who live in Gujarat and in Rajasthan. So it would be impossible to have an election. But at least, Governments should do their homework to find out and put their finger on the pulse of the community. 
Is this person known in the community? Is he or she working at the grassroots level? Will he or she, or she be acceptable? Unfortunately, across the board, probably 80% of the cases, uh, it's not true. You've heard wonderful speakers. When my turn comes, you will be hearing the other side also, which is not very comfortable to hear about the ugly side of certain things. I'm sharing this with you and finishing one ugly moment right now. Even money is involved in acquiring these seats now by true blood and living beings. Money is being spent, favors are being given. It's a very, very sad situation. It's the truth. So friends, maybe prayer, because I know means we know prayer works. I love the idea of what Gopal Krishna Gandhi sir said, becoming politically relevant. But the stage has been reached where to be politically relevant, you have to have Anglo-Indians getting into politics. There is no other way. Venetia Dero did a fantastic job in the first term, but if she wasn't close to the Congress, if she, the political party, if she wasn't with the political party, and even then it became so difficult for her to get a second nomination. Dr. Oscar Nigley has to be close to a political move, a political way of life in the state of Tamil Nadu, just as I was close to a, polit close to a political equation in West Bengal. That, unfortunately, is the reality of the matter, sir. Uh, if you go through the last 20 or 30 years, especially the MPs' questions, Dr. Dias may be the exception. I don't think you'll get too many questions. I don't think you'll get a very good attendance. And you will certainly not get any annual in MP largely in the last 20 or 30 years making an impact because it's a very difficult job also to represent the community because your constituency is the whole of India. But the Dias keeps going around the place trying to get everybody together. It's not very easy. So my humble submission is to tell you that the truth of the matter is it is completely, it has been hijacked, it has been gobbled up by the political system in India. That's the unfortunate truth. And if you go through the speeches, two speeches of mine, the West Bengal Assembly laid this very fact on the table. Please do not use us for political gain. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was interesting. Our next question is from Mr. Keith Butler. And uh, may I ask someone to hand over the mic to him, please? Keith, you have, have to indicate to whom your question is addressed to. Can you hear me? Um, my question, I often wonder, Anglican schools are often commended. Is there seems to be no course of Anglican studies in schools. It's all very well saying we're doing very well, but why is there no course of study? Because my observation is it is the cultural impoverishment that matters, not the physical. Bishop Herbert a long time ago said, Anglos have a surly pride in themselves. If we had a course of studies, we'd know where we came from and where we're going. I just don't understand this blind spot that we have these schools be strategically placed uh, to do something about it. I understand it may be a question of credentialing in later secondary schools. I'm a teacher. But we need our students, our people, all our folks and others to know what our history is, sans Shakespeare, sans this, and sans that. We can have all those things. Thomas Hardy, I was brought up with Batsheva, Batsheva Everdeen in Shakespeare. Did I know anything about the Rosie? Did I know anything about the great artist, Charles Porte? Did I know anything actually about the mutiny and the Cornwall Diaries? It was a solo endeavor by myself. And so I commend the project for anyone who wants to take it out to 
put forward the curriculum. We have experts here. We have many experts. I won't name someone who's actually writing a textbook for our youth. We can feed the body. We need to feed the soul. So the question hangs in the air for anyone who wants to figure out. Thank you. Well, we had the books and authors session uh, the, the day before at Loyola College. That, that question was left hung in the air for anyone who would like to comment. But since I was at the books and authors session the day before at Loyola, and I was interacting with the HOD of the literature department who partnered with us, he was saying that there was a proposal being discussed in the college to introduce one semester for Anglo Indian studies. So this was something that had come up. Our next. Uh, Dr. Mutaya, I want to say something. My name is Mutaya. Mutaya, and Mr. And, uh, the topic today was yesterday's, today's, and tomorrow's. This tomorrow is an issue which has interested me because if you are 150,000 population strong and are worried about tomorrow, I come from a community 125,000 and we are worried about our tomorrows. And there are communities like the Parsis who are less than 100,000. There are communities all over the place which are reducing in number and worrying about what their future is going to be. The future as I see it are the three corners of the mind to open up on the screen. One in the UAE, one in the US, one in Australia. The Anglo Indians of yesterday didn't go into education. Today, it's a very well educated community on the whole. And they moved away from railways and police and things like that. Tomorrow, they, like many other communities like mine, are finding their futures in the UAE. America, Australia. My community alone has 5,000 people in the US. Or I don't know if We have 25,000 abroad. And that's the picture of the enemy. You are not leaving the country because the country doesn't have anything to offer you. It is because you see better opportunities elsewhere. And I think if our opportunities open up, the way we think they yeah, are, the way Mr. Modi promises us, it will happen. You'll find many of us more staying like that. And the communities need not worry as much as they do today for their traditions and their lost practices. Thank you. And now we will come to the end of this first session. Please give our distinguished line of speakers a big hand. We'll now break, we'll have a...